Well, good morning, beloved church family. It is so wonderful to be with you today. As Stephanie and I, we want to welcome you to celebrate seniors ministry. We want to thank you for joining us today. And if this is your first time, we want to thank you for coming. All week long, we've been thinking about you. We've been praying for you, asking God to lift you up, to keep you and bless you. Today, we look forward to spending this service time with you. And we want to say hello to friends, to family, to those who are joining us for the first time. And as always, we give our roll call to the various nursing facilities where we minister, but presently we can't do that due to the coronavirus. So we want those folks, our brothers and sisters there to also know that we're thinking about them. So we do a roll call for them. Our friends at Castle Manor Nursing and Rehab, our friends at Windsor Gardens, and our friends at Friendship Manor, in National City, we say hello. To our friends at Frederica Manor Assisted Living and Senior Retirement Community and the Canterbury Court Senior Living, we say hello. To our friends in Benito, California at Sunrise Senior Living, we say hello. To our friends at the Alzheimer and Dementia Facility in Imperial Beach. Imperial Beach. We say hello, that Sun and Sea Manor. And in San Diego, to the Summit Seniors of Ocean View Church. We want to say hello to everyone and God bless you all. We want to start today by giving you a verse of the day. And that verse comes out of Hebrew chapter 13, verse 2. This is a verse that you can meditate on all day. You can write it down. You can memorize it. Look it up. Something to apply to your life. But this verse says, don't forget to show hospitality to believers you don't know. By doing this, some believers have shown hospitality to angels without being aware of it. You know, we've come together in the name of Jesus Christ today here. So today, let us offer our praise and our thanksgiving. And as we hear and receive God's holy word, and we pray for the needs of this world today, let us all seek forgiveness for our sins by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may we give ourselves to the service of God, especially today. Would you humble yourselves and join me in prayer? Holy Lord, the God who hears our prayers. You have said that you will be present when we gather in your name. And we, your children, thank you. You have provided us with all our needs, God. And you ensure that we are never lacking. Accept our worship in the holy name of Jesus. We pray as we continue today's service that we will feel your presence among us. We pray for all those here listening and watching. And we pray for those who have yet to see your power. That all may come to serve you and grow in you. And at the end of the day, let us go out into the world to glorify your name and to live in your presence. And it's in Jesus' matchless name that we pray. 
And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, it is written, The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Would you join Stephanie and me in singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It is written, Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Please join Stephanie and me again in song as we sing, Revive us again. Revive us. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I want to speak to anyone who is at a place in their story, a place in their life where they're wondering to themselves, is God done with me? Sometimes, more than often, we beat ourselves up for falling short of being perfect, for being as good as we can. And we ask God, why aren't you done with me? How come you still use me in spite of me? And how come you still love me? It is an awesome feeling to be reminded that even if it feels like nobody else is in our corner, he's the God who stays. God has promised to never leave us and that he is in it for the long haul. That he's not fed up with us and that he's not going to give up on any one of us who trust in him. Even when the whole world walks away, he's the God who stays. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, God says, I'll never let you down, never walk off and leave you. Please allow me to sing for you, the God who stays. You're the God who stays. Cause I feel like I'm a lost cause If I were you I would have turned or walked away I would have labeled me beyond repair Cause I feel like I'm beyond repair Oh but somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here You're the God who stays you're the God who stays You're the one who runs in my direction When the whole world walks away You're the God who stands With wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Can separate my heart from the God who stays I used to hide Every time I thought I let you down Always thought I had to earn my way But I'm learning you don't work that way Cause somehow you don't see me like I do Somehow you're still here You're the God who stays You're the God who stays You're the one in my direction When the whole world walks away You're the God who stands With wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Can separate my heart From the God who stays My shame can't separate My guilt can't separate my past can separate I'm yours forever my sin can separate my scars can separate my failures can separate I'm yours forever no enemy can separate no power of hell can take away your Stay. You're the one who runs in my direction
direction When the whole world walks away You're the guy who stands With wide open arms And you tell me nothing I have ever done Can separate my heart from the God who stays Thank you for staying God God who stays. I wanted to talk about a touchy subject today. It's a subject that I spoke on before the coronavirus had come about, especially at the nursing facilities. Stephanie and I had presented them with a little series on this subject and that subject is called depression and I want to speak about it today not to offend anyone but just to talk about the awareness you see depression is a widespread condition affecting millions of people and Christians and non-Christians alike those suffering from depression can experience intense feelings of sadness, of anger, of hopelessness, fatigue, and a variety of other symptoms along those lines. They may begin to feel useless and some even suicidal. Losing interest in things and in people that they once enjoyed. Depression is often triggered by life, life circumstances, such as, for example, a loss of job, death of a loved one, divorce. Some have a family history of depression genetically. There are medical reasons. Illness causes depression, abuse, the taking and overuse of medications, growing old, and many other personal conflicts. You see, depression is described sometimes like being in a hole you can't climb out of. Your hands just can't seem to get to the top of that hole or a net that won't let you go free. Crying doesn't help and neither does rage. Neither does getting mad or frustrated, angry. Sometimes you've, you've prayed with all your might and yet that depression is still there. For those who don't have it, for those who haven't experienced depression or seen it, depression can be hard to understand. You see, a mood disorder, both mental and physical, impacts. That's what it has, both mental and physical impacts. Depression is different from typical feelings of sadness or grief. Some people describe it as feeling like a series of weights that have been placed upon their shoulders, dragging them lower and lower, pushing them down until they can barely crawl. That's heavy. Others say they feel numb, like they're running on a battery that's slowly winding down to a bare hum of energy. It is clear then that depression isn't just a problem today, but it is a problem that people have struggled with for hundreds of years, even before Jesus Christ. It may have been called something else then, but it caused great suffering, great despair, and in some cases, yes, even suicide. 
It was a real problem. A problem that started wars and leveled leaders. And one that had no easy solution. Time after time, the Holy Bible presents stories of depressed people crying out to God, begging for help or for him to just take away the pain. It's, it's not identified as a sin, but an earthly hardship, perhaps much like oppression or even poverty, which Jesus himself said, we will all have with us. In the scriptures, Matthew 26, 11, it says, you will always have the poor with you. You will not always have me. You see, associated with that poor are those depression attitudes. When you review the great names and personalities of the scripture, you become aware very quickly that almost all of them knew at one time or another great discouragement and deep depression. Job in the Bible is singled out as a man of God who is blameless and upright, whose staggering losses and long and painful illness brought him low. Moses was described as the meekest man on earth, rises as one of the greatest examples of an ordinary man who submitted to God, became one of the greatest of all old time characters. He encountered and felt the crushing weight of his assignments and he experienced depression as he led over a million Hebrew people and as he administered God's law. And then at last he cried out, how can I bear the troubles, burdens, and disputes of these people by myself? In Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 12, it is written, but I cannot take care of you and solve all your arguments by myself. Such was Moses. Elijah, a great prophet, went as far as asking for his life to be taken. King David, in his effort to hide sin, made journal entries that speak of the total loss of strength and groaning all day of all that is worthwhile in life ebbing away from him. And there's Jonah. He became deeply despondent when God did not destroy Nineveh. In fact, he ran from God's call three days before spending his time in the fish's belly. Judas Iscariot, so overcome with guilt and pain over the wrong he did in betraying Jesus Christ, hanged himself. And then Jeremiah, another prophet. He was rejected and mocked by his people, struggled with depression, and at a low point in his life, cursed the day he had been born. In Jeremiah 20, verse 14, it is written, curse the day that I was born. Don't bless the day my mother had me. And also in verse 20, in, verse, in chapter 20, verse 18, I'm sorry. It is written, why did I have to come out of her body? All I have seen is trouble and sorrow, and my life will end in shame. What low point that must have been to curse the day you were born. The company of the depressed 
is a very noble company. That's the names I listed and went through. And whether we admit it or not, all of us have been numbered among them. All our lips have spoken the words of discouragement and depression. All our hearts have felt it. Every one of us has known at one time or another the slap of setback, the grief of loss, or the disheartening effect of stress. To be human is to feel that numbing, to feel that exhausting, to feel that demotivating fog of depression. But as with all the problems people face, there's one thing we're supposed to do with them, and that's to bring them to God. First and foremost, turn to God. Jesus Christ acknowledged the weight of our troubles, whether physical or emotional, promising. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You can find that in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Hope does lie in God. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 42, 11, why am I so sad? Why am I so upset? I tell myself, wait for God's help. You will again be able to praise him, your God, the one who will save you. But it is important to understand that just because we put our hope and our faith in God, it doesn't mean our problems will go away. Like cancer, like diabetes, and like other diseases, sometimes we will have it the rest of our earthly life. We must learn to understand that God's power, His almighty power is able to shine more brightly in our weakness when we are focused on the Lord and draw our strength from him. As the apostle Paul said, we are to flee from evil. We are to fight the good fight. Take hold of eternal life. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. But you belong to God, so you should stay away from all those things. Also, try to do what is right, to be devoted to God, and to have faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. We have to fight to keep our faith. Try as hard as you can to win that fight and take hold of eternal life. It is the life you were chosen to have when you confessed your faith in Jesus. That wonderful truth that you spoke so openly and that so many people heard. As for whether or not we are to take medications for depression, the Bible does not address that specifically. But Jesus Christ in his life and ministry made it clear that healing and seeking, seeking healing is a good thing. He also acknowledged that the sick need a doctor. In Matthew 9 verse 12, Jesus says, Jesus heard them say this, so he said to them, it is the sick people who need a doctor, not those who are healthy. All of us should take good measure to alleviate illness and suffering. 
We should seek God first. Let God guide you. Let him show you the way. Either to him directly or the path you should take, whether it be medicines or doctors. He encourages us to call up him in the day of trouble. He says, I will deliver you. The grace of God in Jesus Christ is the sum of all hope. All of us are to be much, much more personal and from the heart when calling on Yahweh and thanking him sacrific sacrificially in our living, the way we live our lives. God loves us and he loves for us to lean on him and for us to turn to him. This is what he desires because he cherishes intimate and tender moments and he cherishes relationships between his people and himself. After we have identified the cause of our depression, we should act on the truth. We must first accept the challenge of faithful obedience. It is important to have faith to progress out of the pit it is a step by step, bit by bit. Listen, small, practical, consistent faith-based faith change occurs in the detail. Small, practical, consistent faith-based change occurs in the detail. Present your request to God. Seek the Lord even in the midst of our struggles. And it is essential to come to God as we are and to seek his power to heal us. In the book of Psalm, chapter 18, verse 32, it is written, it is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. God will protect us even when life feels overwhelming. We can know that his plans for us are good and will prosper. As we journey through the healing process, trust the scriptures. It is essential, vital. So try to remember some verses to help you and to comfort you. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 19, it says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to tread on the heights. Let me say about that. Like the deer, sure-footed. Like the sheep or the rams in the mountains, Similarly related to that family, they have the feet that God has given them. They never fall. They're, they're able to tread on the high heights and jump from mountain to mountain. With God, anything is possible. When we face struggles, we must remember that God will help us to overcome and move past it. God can handle it, or God can guide us to the answer. He is in control. He shows you healing, or he shows you doctors, or he shows you meds. He guides you. God delivers those who seek and love him, who want his advice. No matter what the struggle or the depression, Intentionally drawing near to God can be the first step to healing. This is a tough one, I know. And there are times when finding courage and strength seem near impossible. Seem near impossible. But rather than buckling, rather than giving up, 
under pressure. Scriptures for depression tell us to turn to God first. We don't need to be strong in ourselves, but instead we can seek God's strength and his power to help guide us. Let God's word be the lamp to your feet. In closing, as always, we want to offer to you the salvation prayer, the sinner's prayer. For those of us who have been making mistakes, which should be all of us, for those who, of us who have been having continuous regrets, which should be all of us, not one of us is perfect. You can find grace and peace in God. He took away the punishment and the guilt that we feel and he replaced it with a love. A kind of love that is eternal forever. And it will not be taken away if you make another mistake or another mistake or another mistake. You will always be able to turn to God because he's waiting for you with open arms. Let today be the day that you start a new life in Jesus Christ. You can have a real lasting peace through a relationship with him. God's word says in the book of John chapter three, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Hallelujah. But we've got a problem. Houston, we have a problem. All of us have done, said, thought or acted out things that are wrong. And these things are called sin. And our sins have separated us from God. He's pure and holy. He can't be around it. In Romans 3 verse 23, it is written, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, it is written, For the wages of sin is death, death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's some good news. That is some good news. That Jesus Christ died in our place so we could have a relationship with God and him forever. God reaches out to each one of us and he wants each one of us to be his child. Each one of us can choose to ask Jesus for forgiveness and we can ask him as we open the door to our hearts to come in and be our Lord and Savior. In Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, it is written, if you confess that Jesus is Lord, you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the death, believe that God raised him from the death, you will be saved. For it is by our faith that we are put right with God, put right. It is by our confession that we are saved. Are you ready to confess? Would you pray with me, please? Dear God, I want to be part of your family. You said in your word that if I acknowledge that you raised Jesus from the dead, 
and that I accept him as my Lord and Savior, I would be saved. So God, I now say that I believe you raised Jesus from the dead and that he is alive and well. I accept him now as my personal Lord and Savior. I accept my salvation from sin right now. I am saved. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Thank you, Father God, for forgiving me and giving me eternal life with you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed this prayer for the first time, Stephanie and I, all the saints who trust in Jesus, all the heavenly host, we want to welcome you into the family of God. So we are celebrating right now. And as we celebrate, we're going to continue in love to pray for you in your walk with God. And we'll be praying hard for you all this week as you continue to be safe, you continue to stay your distance, obey the laws, and be safe and be blessed until we see you again next week. God bless you all. We love you. We love you.